Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, and welcome back to uh, week two, uh, lecture one of Dynamic Atomic Force Microscopy Methods. Um, in the last class, uh, we had talked about uh, understanding how the transient uh, oscillations of uh, the probe are affected by the presence of tip sample interaction forces. And uh, we had uh, uh, derived two key results. Uh, the first was that um, when you bring the tip close and it reaches a static deflection, and if you ping it, uh, the natural frequency starts now depending also on the uh, gradients of forces between the tip and the sample. In particular, uh, the tip sample force gradient K sub Ts, uh, when it's negative, we say that it's an attractive uh, um, force gradient, and that makes the natural frequency of the transient oscillations decrease compared to omega naught or F naught, depending on whether you want to write frequencies uh, in radians per second or in hertz. Um, on the other hand, when the tip sample interaction forces uh, are such that the gradient uh, is repulsive, uh, then KTS becomes positive and the natural frequency of the oscillations of the probe actually start increasing. So what we expect to see when you approach a sample is the natural frequency start decreasing, slowing down due to attractive gradients, and then start, as you come even closer, the frequencies should start going up due to uh, repulsive gradients. Uh, the other part of the equation is the dissipation term. And we learned that um, for very small velocities, when the tip is located at some distance, and if you just try to model uh, the effect, the dissipative effect of the tip sample forces, it can be represented uh, by a quantity C sub Ts, which represents the local uh, di dissipation constant or coefficient of dissipation or viscous dash spot. Uh, of the, uh, due to the tip sample interaction forces that model a whole host of um, anelastic or dissipative effect that we have talk talked about before. What that serves to do is to decrease the effect of Q factor, Q prime, which no longer is the same Q uh, wh what it is, which is far from the sample, but rather you get a new Q prime uh, due to these additional tip sample interaction forces. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, instead of looking at the transient motion of the probe, we're now going to move towards understanding how a real dynamic atomic force microscope works. You see, in a real dynamic atomic force microscope, uh, eventually we have to scan over the sample. And if at every point we're going to bring the probe tip and then ping it and study its transient oscillations and then try to move it over, it would be a very slow process. It would do the job. We would be able to uh, get at and understand what the local gradients, uh, force gradients, and, um, and uh, dissipation is, but it would be a very slow process to try and do a ping at every point and then scan over the sample, which is why uh, all of dynamic atomic force microscopy uses excited probes. Uh, in other words, uh, we look at the forced vibration response or the steady state uh, vibration response to excitation. And uh, what I'm going to discuss today is something very uh, fundamental. We're going to take uh, a probe that's driven directly, for example, magnetically, um, or through photothermal excitation or some direct excitation methods. And the case for acoustically excited excitation methods is described in the appendix. Uh, and we're going to approach a sample and ask ourselves a question. Uh, what, what happens in the steady state response of the probe that changes due to the tip sample interaction forces? So to do that, uh, we're going to look at this excited point mass model, uh, and we're going to represent the tip sample interaction forces by the linearized version that we talked about uh, last time. Uh, and the um, equation of motion for the fluctuations uh, are going to be given by equation one, uh, this is basically simply taking the equation we had last time and now adding this effect of external force due to all the additional forces acting on the cantilever to excite it. This external effect of excitation force, Fext, uh, is going to be F naught sine omega t, where omega is the drive frequency in radians per second. Again, we're going to interchangeably uh, switch between omega and F. Omega is radians per second. F is going to be in hertz. 
So equation one, actually, when you look at it, is very similar to uh, the uh, steady state um, equations that we studied for excited probes without dip sample interactions uh, a few lectures ago. Um, the only difference is that in this case, uh, instead of an omega naught um, squared term, where omega dot is the natural frequency far from a sample from a probe, we now have omega prime naught squared. And instead of having the regular Q, we now have Q prime. So in other words, uh, the equation governing uh, the steady state response remains the same, except now the effect of the tip sample interaction force starts creeping in uh, to this equation uh, through its modification of the natural frequency uh, omega naught and the modified Q factor Q prime. So uh, writing the solution for this is going to be fairly easy and it will follow the same strategy we adopted uh, in week one, which is we're going to break up the solution for Q tilde into a homogeneous part which represents the transient vibrations, which we actually studied uh, in the last uh, class already, plus the steady state solution, whose solution will be exactly of the same form as we have studied before, uh, and the uh, transfer function or uh, the ratio of amplitude of oscillations uh, of the tip motion that we would get, uh, which is A divided by uh, the ratio F naught divided by K, is going to be given by equation two here. And the phase lag of the tip motion relative to the forcing acting on it, phi, is going to be given that by equation three. These are all equations we have studied uh, before. The only difference is now that uh, in equation two, instead of the normal Q, we're going to have the modified uh, Q prime due to sample interaction forces. And uh, uh, the ratio R, which used to be the ratio of the drive frequency to the natural frequency, now becomes the ratio of drive frequency omega to the modified natural frequency uh, due to the tip sample interaction forces uh, omega naught prime. So uh, what we can try to do now is a simple uh, thought experiment uh, where we can try to change the uh, omega naught prime as a function of z as one approaches the sample. Uh, and we can try to change CTS, uh, the tip sample dissipation, as a function of Z uh, as, as one approaches the sample. And uh, the details of exact parameters that we're going to use for this uh, simple simulation are shown in the appendix. Uh, but what I will show you are the results uh, of uh, plotting uh, the response uh, given in equation 2 and 3 along with uh, uh, some prescribed variation of uh, Q prime and omega naught prime with respect to Z. And these, uh, th these uh, three-dimensional surfaces are shown uh, on this graph. Effectively, uh, along one axis you have Z uh, in nanometers. This represents uh, the Z distance as you approach the sample. Your Z is decreasing as you approach the sample. While on the other axis you've got the drive frequency uh, in hertz uh, this time ranging from 190,000 hertz or 190 kilohertz to uh, about 210 kilohertz. And uh, the original natural frequency of this probe far from the sample was 200 kilohertz. Uh, the original Q factor uh, was 100 and all this information is given uh, in the appendix. Um, but in the graph on the, on, the, on the plot on the left is plotted the transfer function which is uh, the product of uh, the amplitude of the tip oscillation uh, with the K uh, effective spring constant divided by F naught, the magnitude of excitation uh, uh, of the force applied to the cantilever. Uh, as one approaches the sample, one moves from a large Z value to a smaller Z value. And at very large Z value, at about 0.8 value of Z, uh, of Z equal to 0.8, one notices a nice uh, resonance response, steady state resonance response, as we have uh, talked about before, which represents the amplitude uh, that which the probe tip will want to oscillate uh, depending on the drive frequency. Now keep in mind that these are steady state uh, oscillations, so at every drive frequency, the cantilever responds exactly at the drive frequency uh, as far as the steady state solution is concerned. So one sees this nice uh, canonical resonance curve when Z is very large. Once the Z starts decreasing, coming closer to the sample, 
one very important effect that happens is there are attractive forces, so the omega naught prime uh, due to the attractive gradients starts decreasing or the F naught prime starts decreasing. Uh, again, F naught prime is the uh, modified uh, natural frequency of the probe due to the tip sample interaction forces in hertz, whereas omega naught prime is the same quantity in radians per second. So as we come close to the sample, we find that um, F naught prime decreases, but then when you come very close to the sample, it starts shifting to higher frequencies due to the repulsive force gradients between the tip and the sample. <laughs> On the other hand, if one looks at the plot on the right, uh, one sees a response of the phase, uh, again in this three-dimensional plot. Uh, one approaches uh, the sample uh, along one direction and the drive frequency is along the other direction. And uh, since, we have, since we know that the phase lag reaches 90 degrees exactly when uh, the drive frequency equals the natural frequency, it's not surprising that um, uh, the the phase lag becomes 90 degrees uh, depending, it, it depends, where it becomes 90 degrees depends on the drive frequency. So as one approaches the sample, we find that we hit the 90 degree phase point uh, at slightly lower frequencies from the original 200 kilohertz, but when one approaches even closer to the sample, uh, one has to go to higher frequencies, drive frequencies, to find the 90 degree uh, phase lag point. The contour uh, of the 90 degree phase lag is shown on the surface telling us about the fact that we have to change the drive frequency uh, initially to a lower value and then to a higher value in order to keep at, if we want to keep at a 90 degree phase lag. So this is a very fundamental curve that tells us, gives us a really beautiful picture as to what is happening to the oscillator, oscillation, uh, oscillator due to tip sample interaction forces? Uh, on the left, I want to highlight two things. Uh, clearly, you see what's happening is uh, the tip sample interaction uh, is causing the resonance peak to shift, first to lower frequencies and then to higher frequencies due to the tip sample interaction forces. But there's a, very, there's a second very important effect that's going on is uh, in the appendix, you'll look at the model for CTS that I included in this simulation, in this plot, but what you find is that when you're far from a sample, the resonance peak is very sharp, so the Q is high. When you come closer to the sample, the tip sample dissipation changes the Q prime, decreases the Q prime, so the curves become shallower as one goes down. Um, so uh, with this sort of a global plot, uh, we are going to do uh, three thought experiments. Uh, the first thought experiment is going to be uh, to try and approach uh, the sample with the directly excited probe. Uh, we're going to keep the drive frequency constant and ask the question, um, if we kept the drive frequency constant and simply approached the sample, uh, what would happen to the amplitude and phase uh, of this oscillator? And then we'll do a couple of more thought experiments where we'll try to approach using other techniques, using phase lock loops and other uh, feedback techniques. So I'm going to go over to the board now and try to answer or th try to get us to start thinking about what would happen if one approached the sample um, keeping the drive frequency fixed. So what I have here on the top is the uh, amplitude of the transfer function, which is the tip oscillation amplitude times k uh, divided by f naught as a function of the drive frequency f in hertz. And when you're far from a sample, you get a nice resonance peak due to uh, the uh, direct excitation. If you look at the phase lag, which goes from zero degrees to 180 degrees, phase lag starts from zero, reaches 90 degrees value when the drive frequency equals f naught, and then goes to 180 degrees. This is when you're far from a sample. Now we've just learned that when you're close to the sample, uh, and you're experiencing attractive uh, force gradients, this natural frequency is going to want to shift to the left. The second effect that happens is uh, that the Q factor is going to decrease, become Q prime, so the curve is going to become a little fatter and squatter. So what would happen when you're close to the sample is you might get a curve that looks like this. So that this value of frequency becomes F0 prime, this is the new natural frequency. 
And uh, the phase versus the frequency would also change following the dashed line. so that uh, it reaches 90 degrees at a lower value of uh, drive frequency, okay? So if we were to do this thought experiment and approach the sample while keeping the drive frequency F fixed at the original F naught, as one approaches the sample, two things would happen. The, the resonance peak would start shifting to the left and would become wider. As a result, if you stayed at the same drive frequency, the amplitude would decrease from that peak value to this number here. That decrease would be from two reasons. It would be one, because the natural frequency has shifted to the left uh, from underneath uh, the main resonance curve, causing the amplitude to decrease, because now the drive frequency is greater than the natural frequency. But the second reason why the amplitude decreases is also because this curve has become shorter and squatter due to the increased uh, or the decreased Q prime. So two reasons why the amplitude goes down, the natural frequency has shifted underneath the drive frequency and the damping has increased. Uh, if one looks at the phase response, we see a very interesting effect. We see that if we stick to our drive frequency, uh, original drive frequency equaling F naught, as this resonance frequency shifts to the left due to attractive force gradients, if one stays with the same drive frequency, one would reach a phase lag that becomes greater than 90 degrees, would actually start approaching uh, 180 degrees in the extreme case. So this brings us to a very interesting uh, uh, conclusion that if you took a uh, directly excited uh, cantilever probe at resonance F equal to F naught and approached the sample, we would see two effects. We would see the amplitude initially starts decreasing due to a combination of attractive force gradients and uh, dissipation CTS, and that the phase would start going up. Phase lag would increase above 90 degrees. However, when one goes to really small Z distances, uh, the uh, natural frequency would, F naught prime, would start increasing again, and things would change. So what I've plotted um, on the next uh, slide here is a result of this thought experiment uh, actually implementing this uh, on the model that I showed in the last slide. Uh, on the left, I've shown the amplitude uh, uh, multiplied by k divided by f naught as a function of z. Uh, for the case when the drive frequency f is fixed to be f naught, which is 200 kilohertz. And we see very interestingly that the amplitude starts decreasing when you approach the sample, z decreases. And we also notice that the phase lag starts increasing above 90 degrees and keeps going up to a large value. But then at the very bottom, at a very low value of z, we actually find that the amplitude starts increasing again. Why would that happen? Um, and it's interesting to ask the question because this happens because uh, when we fix the drive frequency, Keep in mind that the natural frequency of the oscillator first decreases to lower frequencies, so the amplitude decreases because you're off resonance. But then due to repulsive interactions, this peak starts turning back and starts increasing in frequency. So there's going to be a certain value of z at which the drive frequency becomes equal to the natural frequency again. And as you press a little closer, the natural frequency again shifts to larger values because of repulsive interactions. As a result, at very small values of z, you can see some interesting features such as possibly increase in the amplitude. Uh, but keep in mind that when we keep the drive frequency fixed and approach the sample, these changes in amplitude that occur are due to a combination of two effects, uh, due to the attractive and repulsive force gradients, but also due to CTS, which is the tip sample dissipation. Both conspire to decrease the amplitude. CTS is always going to decrease the amplitude, is going to decrease, uh, is going to increase the damping and decrease the Q prime. Uh, the uh, KTS term, the tip sample force gradients, uh, depending on the sign, whether it's negative or positive, will shift the natural frequency from the drive frequency and cause a decrease in amplitude. Uh, when we look at the right-hand side of the phase lag, when, the, when we are in the attractive regime, the phase 
is going to be above 90 degrees, uh, like I told you. However, when the Z becomes small enough that you're in the repulsive regime, what happens now is the resonance frequency has shifted to larger frequencies and the phase now decreases to below 90 degrees. So this is what would happen if one took a fixed uh, uh, dry frequency and approached the sample. On the other hand, if you do a second uh, thought experiment using something called a phase-locked loop, and we're going to talk about phase-locked loops in some more detail in the next class, but uh, let's do the thought experiment this time that uh, we uh, allow the dry frequency to change uh, so that uh, we keep the phase lag fixed at 90 degrees and now we approach the sample. So if you go back to uh, the three-dimensional surface uh, I showed you, um, and I may want to flip back to that slide, um, what we're going to do with uh, the uh, uh, phase lock loop is to now track that resonance peak as it approaches the sample. In other words, the drive frequency is now going to decrease and then increase to follow where the resonance peak is located. I'm going to move back. If one does that, one would find that the phase would remain fixed at 90 degrees as one approaches the sample, as shown in the middle graph. So as Z approaches the sample, uh, the phase remains fixed at 90 degrees because the drive frequency is changing. On the very left is plotted the amplitude versus Z. And sure enough, the amplitude decreases now uh, as a function of Z. And two important things to notice, uh, the first is that uh, the uh, decrease in amplitude is monotonic. We do not get a change in amplitude as you go to very small z values. It just keeps decreasing. Um, and the second thing to keep in mind is that since the drive frequency always changes so that it equals f naught prime, you're always at the resonance peak. The only reason why there's a decrease in amplitude has to be that the tip sample dissipation CTS is actually increasing. In other words, the decrease in the amplitude is only due to tip sample dissipation, is not due to uh, attractive or repulsive force gradients that shift the resonance peak from underneath uh, the drive frequency. This is a very important conclusion we need to keep in mind. Uh, the graph on the very right is telling us how the drive frequency f had to change as you approach the sample to keep the phase at 90 degrees. And you see that initially the drive frequency had to go to lower frequencies and then to higher frequencies to, to track the drive frequency. So the last, last graph on the, on, the, on the right is often uh, depicted as being the uh, frequency shift uh, channel in a lot of AFM. So this would be a thought experiment where we approach the sample using a uh, phase-locked loop and the drive frequency is no longer constant. The last thought experiment we'll do is we approach with a phase lock loop and we add a second controller. What if we uh, add on a second controller where F naught, the excitation magnitude, uh, changes to keep the tip oscillation amplitude constant? So as a result, what would happen in this thought experiment is going to be the following. As one approaches the sample, the amplitude of oscillation now will be constant because you're trying to keep the oscillation amplitude constant by increasing the uh, excitation magnitude as you approach the sample. Plus you have a phase lock loop, which means you're changing the drive frequency so that it e e equals the modified natural frequency F naught prime, uh, so that one is always at a phase lag of 90 degrees. In this case, uh, as you approach the sample, both the phase and the amplitude of oscillation are going to remain fixed of this oscillator. On the other hand, the drive frequency f would change as shown on the right. It would first decrease and then increase. The second thing that would change is shown on the left. Uh, this is the drive magnitude. As one approaches the sample uh, with a phase locked loop, remember the amplitude would tend to decrease because of increased dissipation CTS. However, if you increase the magnitude of excitation, f naught, you can counter that and you would have to increase the f naught to match the increased dissipation due to the tip sample interaction forces. And this thought experiment is actually the foundation of uh, frequency modulation atomic force microscopy, which we'll talk about in the next class. Uh, but uh, these three thought experiments of how this oscillator would respond as we come closer to the sample are essential to start thinking about 
the commonly used scanning modes, uh, which are uh, the tapping mode or amplitude modulation, AFM, uh, phase, uh, phase locked loop uh, based uh, tapping mode, or uh, frequency modulation atomic force uh, microscopy. Thank you very much. See you next time.